Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. We're so glad you could attend. Come inside, come inside. Yes, it's another episode of the Music Talks podcast. Fiercely independent and looking to the fringes as well as the mainstream for the people that really make this industry tick. As always, I'm Leon Hill, and we have a great show ready to go for you this week. But before we get started, you may have noticed we've been away a little longer than usual. Well, it's August, and it's summer on this side of the equator, so it's that time of year when things become a little more relaxed. It's holiday time, it's kickback time, and we're no more immune to that than you are. But here we are, back once again. Super quick roundup before we hit the ground running with this week's guest. Fair to say, we are very happy to see that we now have listeners in 24, count them, 24 countries. Excellent! Big shout out to all of you, and thank you for your support as we continue in our mission to become the number one alternative music industry podcast. And a very special welcome to our new listeners in South Africa, and Jumbo to our new listeners in Kenya too. <laughs> as always, please subscribe. If you have a spare three seconds and you like what we're doing, click on all five of those stars. And if you love what we're doing, take a minute to write a review. And a huge thank you to everyone that has so far. It really does mean a lot, folks. As usual, we are everywhere. So wherever you get your podcasts from, please subscribe and don't miss another episode. And listen, if somebody's making you listen to adverts, we're not getting paid for those ads. So why don't you take yourself somewhere else and subscribe to someone who won't feed you adverts. Wherever you listen to us, just make sure you get a nice, clean experience. We're on Instagram and Twitter as at Hello Music Talks, so give us a follow and stay up to speed on all things Music Talks. Now, this week, it seems that everywhere you look and listen, we're seeing and hearing how fertile the music industry is right now. So I thought it was about time we dug deep into what it's like to operate a music service in these golden years. In honour of our new African listeners, we have a very special guest this week. He'd never worked in music before, packed his bag and headed to West Africa to work with someone he'd never met, in a country that was totally alien to him, and to work on a project he knew nothing about. So, the question is why? And what sort of person does that? This is what we will try and find out from today's guest. As well as getting the lowdown on one of the last big markets the global music machine has yet to truly crack. Martin Nielsen is an extraordinary young man. For the last seven years, he has been at the helm of Undundu the music service based in Nairobi and carving its own unique path across Africa. In a territory, country, continent that struggles with many of the things we take for granted in the West. And I'm not talking about broadband, mobile connectivity, online payment systems, although those are all issues. I'm talking about the things far more fundamental than that. Uninterrupted power supply, infrastructure, stable government and currencies. So how do you build a world-class music service in this environment, where there are no hard or fast rules, where Western major labels and global streaming services still fear to tread? With passion, interest, and the kind of drive that few of us possess. Martin is a fascinating man, and is arguably driving Mdundo to the front and centre of music consumption, certainly in Kenya, West Africa, and beyond. Not only that, but after seven years, he now finds himself out front in a market whose speed of growth is only matched by its potential for growth. And if you're taking a strategic look at music in Africa right now, this is going to be essential listening. And if you want to hear the kind of sounds that are driving the service, check out the accompanying Spotify playlist for the show, handpicked by Martin and perfect if you want to hear the sound of sunshine booming out of your speaker. Search Spotify for Music Talks Podcast and hit subscribe. Please excuse the audio on this show. We've done our best, but what with being bounced off satellites and squeezed through undersea cables, the audio does warp out a little bit here and there. So, without further ado, 
Meet the marvellous Martin Nielsen. Music talks. Hi, Martin Nielsen. Welcome to Music Talks podcast. Thank you for joining us this week. Thank you very much. Before we get into things, we're not sitting in the same room. Usually I'm sitting opposite my guests and we can see each other and we can talk to each other. But Martin, tell us where you are and what you do there. Yeah, thanks for having me, first of all. Currently, I'm in Nairobi, in, in Kenya. Yeah, I'm working with a, with, a, with a music service here called Mdundo that I was a part of starting and trying to figure out how to, how to, to sort of leverage and build a, a stronger music business in, in, on this continent, in Africa. I guess my, my first question, Kenya, Nairobi, that's not your home country, hometown. No. Where are you from and how did you manage to get from there to, to Africa? Yeah, well, so I, I'm originally uh, from, from Denmark, from a suburb a bit, a bit north of, of Copenhagen. Yeah, I, I, got to, I got to Kenya because there's a Danish serial entrepreneur who started a, a tech investment fund for, for Africa. And he, he wanted to, uh, to invest in sort of, sort of all kinds of different content on, on uh, content businesses on this continent and, and tech investments in Africa. And I thought that sounded really interesting. At the time, I was uh, studying in, in, in London, actually. And I emailed the guy sort of a little bit out of nowhere, I found his contacts on, on, on LinkedIn, emailed him and asked if, oh, if he would be looking for anyone to help him build this tech startups in, in Africa. And he luckily said yes. And I found myself on my way to East Africa, to Kenya. And uh, quite quickly after landing here, I hadn't really worked in music before, but had a very strong interest and passion for the industry. And, and it was sort of a, a hope and, and, and dream for me. And one of the things that was very clear for us, uh, or clear for me as well, was that this sort of transition that we have seen in, in, in the Western world over the last, well, I guess, 15 years now, we're sort of moving people into streaming business, hadn't really taken place here. And there wasn't really many uh, projects or interesting projects to invest in of, of businesses who were trying to do that. And so we tried to understand better what, what the challenges were, and, and we started getting into, into that. You arrived in Nairobi. You, you didn't really have much of a support network to speak of other than the people that you're going to be working with. Correct. Tell us a little bit about the service. What kind of, what kind of thing are we talking about? The, the service, as it, as it looks today, it's trying to tackle um, the same, the same uh, it's trying to sort of build the same as what, as what Spotify and Apple Music and, and so on has done in the West. The way it looks currently is, is, a, is a download service. So it's a, it's a mobile website where you can go to the website, you can download and stream uh, music from your, from your phone. Um, most people do it directly in their browser. Um, we do have an, an Android app as well, which is, is the most popular operating system here. Uh, but majority of all our, all our users use our mobile website. They come in, they find a selection of, of music and catalog, uh, mostly from the continent, but also the world. And they can then uh, download and, and stream the music directly from there. Um, it's a free model. So it's a freemium model where we have a paid tier as well. But uh, as of today, the majority, like, all our focus is on the free tier. Uh, yeah, so you can actually download all the music free of charge, and we then um, yeah sell advertising space um, to to different clients. I know, having worked with similar type services, and I know that sometimes it can take a long time to build the advertising revenues yeah. to such a level that it can sustain the service. Yeah, how, how is that working for you guys? Is mobile is the advertising working sufficiently for you, or is that part of the business you're still trying to build? So it's it's significantly better than than when we started, but it, as you're completely right, it, it does take quite a bit of of time two challenges in parallel that, that we are working with here. One of them is introducing a new format, which is in the Western world, there has been the challenges with, with similar services there that well, when you're introducing a new format to the advertising industry, it, it requires a bit of education and understanding from the advertisers of what am I gaining from this channel and this advertising format. Um, but then secondly, we got a challenge, which is that it is still a, a fairly early market. Um, like uh, Africa at the moment is a very, very fast growing, but it is still very early. So that means majority of all uh, advertising spending still goes into traditional channels and um, billboards, TV, radio, and digital is, as much as it's very quickly growing, still a fairly small part of the, of the pie. Um, so, so there's sort of two, two things there that we are sort of trying to work at at the same time. We have been quite early to the, to the market, but we're seeing, especially the last year or two, 
a very very rapid growth and 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 I think it, it's it is as as is as a, a very interesting channel for many advertisers because they do have an even bigger challenge reaching people here even with advertising than than we do in in the West in the West there's a number of substitutes for, for doing that and here it can be a little bit harder so the second you actually manage to reach a certain audience then it has a significantly higher value and an interest from the advertisers just to jump back you arrived in Nairobi yes was the platform was the service up and running or did you sort of just manage to sort of slot into that fairly seamlessly or was this something that was part of your job and the job that you were going there to do was to pull this together and, and launch it yeah we, we were starting it completely from scratch. I very clearly remember and my one of my, my, my colleagues who's now in, in the board came to me and said, well, we have this idea of doing something within music. I met a few artists here who don't really have anywhere to, to distribute their content and the few current channels that they do have are uh, very heavily controlled by third parties who, who eat up the margins. And at the same time, we don't really see many good uh, music services or good ways of actually consuming content from this continent. There must be something within that space uh, that we can look at. And he sort of came with, with a one pager to me and said, well, if you're interested, spend spend a few hours a week and try and see if that's something we could uh, make some sort of proof of concept around. And I, uh, I found it very interesting and sort of jumped on it uh, pretty much right away. Two major components that I really wanted to, to figure out is, well, number one, is it something that, that the content owners or the artists, musicians, labels, and so on would be interested in? Um, and number two, is it something that we can find the right corporate partners, sponsors, advertisers, and so on to be a part of. And actually, quite quickly, we found an interest from the musicians and from the content owners. I think that wasn't really a surprise, uh, considering that they didn't really have many other revenue streams at, at the time. But what, what even surprised us more was when we went to a few of the potential advertisers and bigger sort of advertising partners, they showed a lot of interest from the beginning. Music was or is here the same as it is many other places, a key pillar for very many brands and a key differentiator, and not only for local brands, but also international brands who are sort of entering, have a, a look and feel a bit more local. And for them, working with, with local artists was a, was a great way to sort of get in at eye height with the consumers. Quite quickly, within a few months, we decided that there's a market fit here. We started investing a little bit in the in the project and started building um, a small business from there. So it was started uh, pretty much from scratch. And so that was about, what, five, five years ago now, you say? It's more. It must be seven. I think that was... That was towards the end of, of, of 2012. Yeah, so, so sort of throughout 2013, we'd, we tried different models. So I think one thing was quite clear for us from the beginning was we weren't really sure. Uh, well, two things, really. I knew much, much less about music business back then than I, than I do today. So, so that was a bit new, complete new area for me. And, and for an outsider, it, it can be a bit hard to sort of figure out how it works. But secondly, we weren't really sure about which model was the right one. So we had sort of on the drawing board a, a paid service um, or should it be a free service? Is what is it actually that we want to want to do? Um, so sort of the service as it exists today has been going since since fourteen, so r- roughly yeah, five years. Well, I mean, it sounds interesting, and and you're right. I mean, I imagine it's been a fairly sort of steep learning curve from your point of view. Are you just live in Kenya, or, or or is the service available in other other territories on the continent? So we are currently actually live uh, worldwide. So the service is, is mobile web based, and it's available pretty much everywhere. There's there's a bit of catalog that's uh, restricted, but a lot of the catalog is available from pretty much everywhere. Sort of the key to being having an actual live offering in a, in a particular market has very much been um, the local catalog or the catalog from that uh, country that is live on the on the platform. And currently we have sort of an A&R sort of content operation in, in Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, here in, in East Africa, which is sort of the three first markets we got into. And then over the last year, year and a half, we've gotten a lot more catalog in West Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, and Cameroon, and in Southern Africa, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and, and Mozambique. And then we've added in Wanda as well as, as the 10. Um, so, so we've got quite a good catalog from those markets. And in that sense, those are the markets that our service is really relevant for. A&R content operation? What on earth does that mean? Well, this is something that we will hear more about from Martin in the second half of this interview. 
and stay tuned because it's as unique as it is fascinating. I have never in all my years in this industry heard of any music service collating their catalog of music in this way. And without giving too much away, it's exactly as Martin says. They perform both A&R function and content acquisition function. That is, independently searching out new artists and new music in order to add their content to the service. Welcome to the world of building a music platform in territories where there's a negligible record label presence. A place where you aren't just building a service, you're helping to build the infrastructure of an industry. How does this work in practice? And what are the not inconsiderable benefits? Stay tuned and find out. Do you find you get a lot of, or is there much of an audience of Africans that have migrated away to Europe, the US, other countries? Do so. I think sort of if you look at the, at the market opportunity, or sort of where the where the market opportunity is for African content and for for the music industry here, you can sort of put them into two pillars. There is the diaspora communities, or uh, yeah, as you're, as you're explaining, people with ties to Africa, Africans living abroad, uh, or some particular reason have a, have an interest in in the music here. And then you have the actual local market. And I think particularly Nigeria um, has really worked well with the diaspora market. Africa right now is, is a little bit more than a billion people um, and it's a massive market and that also means that they have a massive a number of Nigerians living in, in the UK, in the US and so on. Um, and so they have, they have to some extent really managed to, to tap into that. Um, for many of the other markets, it can be quite difficult because a big difference that I feel between uh, Africa and, and, for example, Latin America, uh, which has, has seen a lot of sort of transformation in the last couple of years, is that you don't really have common languages here. So you have a lot of different languages, a lot of different countries and a very, very many different cultures. Um, and that means that tapping into, for example, diasporas and so on can be a little bit more difficult. For example, the, the Kenyan diaspora community is significantly smaller than the Nigerian one. And if you look at towards Rwanda or any of the other sort of uh, smaller countries on the continent, that has made it a little bit difficult to, to, to follow that model. And our focus has always been on the continent. Let's quickly pull up some data on Africa, the birthplace of some of the most vibrant rhythms and music on the planet. As of last year, the population was 1,287,920,580. So just shy of 1.3 billion people. These people are spread across 54 recognized countries, Western Sahara and Somaliland currently being disputed territories. And across the continent, there are a staggering amount of languages spoken, up to 2,000. Contrast that with the 24 languages spoken across Europe, or the four spoken in North America, or the two in South America. Now, imagine localizing a service, any service, so that it can be understood and enjoyed across the African continent. <laughs> yeah, right. Let's hear more from Martin. Cool. Certainly not very long ago, there wasn't really much of a label or rights holders presence in, uh, well, I think probably South Africa was probably the limit. You know, you had the Sony's, the Universals and the Warners based down there. How are you doing your licensing deals and do you do you have much international catalogue available on the service? That That's completely correct. There isn't much sort of structure here, to, to be completely honest. The content market or the sort of licensing market is extremely chaotic and extremely fragmented um, across the whole continent. So I think a lot of the key value in, in what we are building and, and the business we have built over the last couple of years is in, in that part of the business model. Uh, and that part of the supply chain is, is actually around content. As you're correctly saying, you don't really have many record labels present here. And what we have had to do licensing catalog directly with individual artists. And so uh, if there's a new song coming out, uh, the first thing we have to do is identify well, who actually owns the rights for this song, which is not necessarily something you can just look up anywhere. So you have to maybe call someone or find out who this guy actually is and knocking on doors. And when you find the right guy who actually owns the catalog, then you sign uh, on whatever assets that it is that are of interest directly from them. Today, we've done that with, I think, 55,000 artists across the continent who are sort of directly signed up to our service one by one. And that is what brings us sort of a big catalog of African content and also a reason for people to use our service. A, a parallel to that is, I think, one of the main reasons why people uh, in the Western world jumped into streaming services is the fact that you can get a, a catalog which is almost 100% without any uh, big gaps in it. You can find pretty much whatever mu music you're looking for. Um, and that makes it an easy sort of solution for you to jump into 
um, as a as a sort of competitive alternative to peer to peer sharing or sort of sort of illegal ways of of file sharing. And building that here has just been difficulty because for you to have a catalog that doesn't have holes in it or big gaps, big artists missing uh, or, or new songs missing, it requires a, a very vogue team that constantly makes sure that whatever new song comes up in Wanda, uh, we, we actually manage to get it on the platform. So that process has been a very big part of, or is today a very big part of our business and has probably been what took the longest to try and establish and, and, and figure out. Just, just to get this straight, rather than going to a, a record label, for example, or, or some collective rights holder doing a single deal, licensing their entire catalogue, which you then pump out onto the platform, you're having to effectively listen to the radio, find out who the artist is, contact that artist, and then come to an, an individual agreement with them for that piece of music. Well, that sounds like a lot of work. It is a lot of work, but it also requires a lot of work to build value, I think. So for us, it's obviously a, a big process, but I think it's also an exciting process because it's really wanting to see that we are building something that has a value for our our end consumers. And by now we're starting to get a catalog that's big enough. User can actually say, well, I'm better off using uh, Mdundo as a music service than I am getting all the music, ripping it off YouTube or whatever other sort of illegal, fairly uh, easy uh, hacks there is to get access to this music. Because the reality really is that what this has done, and it, it sounds a bit about sort of it sounds a bit of a whatever was taking place in, in, in Europe there 10, 15 years ago. But that is really the reality that the easiest way to get access, in many cases, the only way to get access to a, a new song by a, a major uh, African artist is to rip it off YouTube or get it sent to you by a friend who's found it somewhere. Like there isn't really any uh, legal challenge channels that are uh, sufficient enough. I'm not saying that there isn't any. There's plenty of, of people trying to do what we're doing as well. Very few of them manage to actually give a sort of a, a decent alternative where you can get the catalog you want to in, an, in the ease of getting it from an illegal platform and, and at the cost of an, of an illegal, uh, illegal platform. So I think that is really some of the, the major challenges that we are looking at here, but also where the, the major value is and why our service has grown the way it has grown over the years. What sort of growth rate have you had? Um, no, so today today we got around 3, 3.5 million users of the service every month. They totally download around 10 million tracks of the platform every month. Um, but a significant amount of those users are in our original markets, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, uh, where we have a decent sort of both brand and, and a decent penetration. Uh, or what we have sort of done the last year or so is to take that model and deploy it in, in other markets uh, where we see the same needs um, and the same opportunities as we as we see here. Sort of going back to my point earlier about uh, the market being very fragmented by uh, many different countries and many different languages. Um, so one of the key points for us is to has been to build a model that is very scalable so that um, it can easily and with relatively low additional cost be adopted to new markets. Or the reason why the low cost is quite important for us is that we do deal with a, with a market that is quite early days and uh, the average sort of spending power and so on is is relatively small, still sort of growing in that space as well. So for you to actually do something that's something that makes sense in the long run, you've got to find a way where you can do it at a, at a relatively low cost. Then there's a, a massive margin to be collected because you do have... Yeah, as I said earlier, a billion people, uh, around 200 million smartphones on the continent of people who would be interested in or who are interested in listening to this music and who does not at the moment have a good alternative. So I think the key very much is to try and, and deliver such a service. Um, and that's, that's what we are working on. Those numbers are great. So congratulations on driving those, that sort of traffic to the platform. You mentioned earlier about the alternative. Ripping tracks from, from YouTube was one example. What is the piracy situation like in Africa? How bad is it? And, and is that tanker being turned around in Europe? opinion it's very bad uh, i would say this is the main consumption of any content not only music and um, but also music there's a handful of of serious businesses who are trying to to build alternatives and i would say and this is just my sort of guesstimate that all of the legal services combined doesn't even account for five percent of all the content consumed on the continent it, it is a small sort of share of the of the content consumption that is through any of the formal or legal entities or channels or, or, or platforms. And and I think it is turning around. I think it's turning around for, for a number of reasons. One of them is that internet penetration is, is really growing fast. Smartphone penetration is really growing fast. So people start getting smartphones in their hands. They start having internet on them and start being able to consume and, and afford the internet as well. But I think one of the major challenges to 
for that transformation. Uh, buying data to download a song is still relatively expensive. Having that data is is or using that data on a song is a, is a big decision. That data could be used on checking emails or checking Facebook or with all the other alternatives online. Um, so we do find that uh, both ripping off YouTube, but also in many markets, uh, peer-to-peer sharing through either platforms that are at very low cost or just like US, uh, USB sticks, transferring from phone to phone without using an internet connection in, in, in different ways is a massive way of, of music to, to be distributed. It is rapidly turning around and I think sort of adding a brighter picture to what I just said, as much as you have a lot of people who might not be able to uh, to use many of these services yet or be ready for legal legal services, you, you do have big segments, especially in the urban areas. So uh, in Nigeria, in Kenya, in Tanzania, in Uganda, uh, you can find a group of a few million people who would who would have the means and would have the data and would be able to to jump into to services that we as we know globally. In my opinion, it's still a relatively small segment, uh, but it might be a critical mass that is big enough for uh, for services to start looking at. Interesting. So, so I think that's that's sort of the situation in terms of in terms of piracy. So instead of trying to say how do we make uh, an Apple Music or a Spotify or whatever that is adaptable for for a certain market. How do we actually what are what are people how are people uh, consuming music today and how do we tap into that mass market? Because I think that's where we start getting real numbers and that's where we start getting a size where we we, we start actually getting uh, real numbers and real scale and start changing people's behaviors into something that we can all monetize in one way or another. I mean, I'm guessing you aren't the only guys doing this. What's the competitive landscape like that you're working within? Any of the other big sort of more global names, um, streaming platforms, live and active anywhere on the continent at the moment? How's how's that looking generally? And, and how are they doing if they are? As mentioned earlier, I think the last one, two years has really started building uh, building interest globally on, on, the, on, on this continent, both from, from the majors and from the labels. Uh, from the distributors, but also from the from the platforms. So sort of 360 in the industry, there starts to be a lot more movement. I think sort of on the on the on the platform side, uh, we have Apple Music live in a, in a in a few territories. That's been the case from 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 for for a while back. And um, but then actually, most of the live and sort of more aggressive uh, services are um, out of out of uh, sort of Asia. So we have uh, we have Tencent, which has a music service in, in South Africa called Dukes, um, who are very currently only available in South Africa. It's a lot more mature market than than the rest. And then we have an, a service called Boomplay, which I, I don't think is alive anywhere else than than in Africa, um, but it's owned by a transition group, transition group, also involved in a big mobile handset manufacturing uh, company. So they have millions and millions of smart uh, smartphones that they are distributing in the market. And all of them comes pre-installed with this uh, Boomplay app. Um, so you can sort of call it a, a, an alternative to, I guess, Apple Music, or sort of more similar to Apple Music because of the, the business structure and gives uh, all of these people uh, direct access to an app that has similar functionalities as, as you would find uh, any other global music um, app to have. As far as I'm aware, well, then there's YouTube, of course. YouTube is a massive, I would say, sort of alternative or a massive channel for consuming uh, music on the continent. Not the YouTube music service, but the, the YouTube app video um, service. Those are the ones we compare ourselves the most to. Um, I think a major difference from what we're doing is, as I mentioned before, we, we try maybe go a little bit more low market. So many of the alternatives that has come in over the years and, and also that are active right now is is heavily app-based and sort of saying, well, how do we build a hybrid between what you're doing in the continent and um, what globally is the, is the case studies and to sort of try and attract the critical mass into those services so that we can, we can start building a music industry around that. Um, whereas I think we as a service has tried to go a lot more uh, low market and, and trying to focus more on what people are actually, the way people are consuming music now and seeing how we can grow with the people into the right uh, music solutions for, for, for them. I think it's, in- it's interesting you mentioned YouTube because it doesn't matter how many conversations you have about streaming music platforms, download platforms, who's the biggest, who's the best, who's got the largest footprint, the largest subscriber base. Everybody overlooks the biggest music service in the world is YouTube. And you're right, the videos, not the dedicated music service. No doubt. You know, no doubt. The, 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 the numbers, the, the amount of people that get their music through YouTube, the YouTube platform globally just knock everything else off the table. Absolutely. So I think it's, it's something that people overlook. And especially given the amount of time that 
you know, frankly, they were operating uh, on an unlicensed basis, taking advantage of, of the safe harbour provisions. But that's probably a, another conversation for a, for another day. No, yeah, no, I was just going to say it, it is a different conversation. But at the same time, it's also very obvious when you look at it, when you look at it that way, because you, you have the reason why YouTube can grow so big in, in these or is so big in these markets is because it does offer all the content that is not available on any other music services and that any other music services is fighting to get rights for. We have actually looked a lot towards what has been the success uh, of YouTube in that sense, because for many artists here, that is actually a, a contributor to, to, their, to their income. Agreed. Agreed. No, I think you're absolutely right. And you mentioned as well, very important point. I mean, an artist can start earning money from YouTube pretty much straight away if they're getting the traffic to their videos. Yeah. And just on that point briefly, what is the business like from an artist's perspective? Is it relatively easy to make a, a living from? Uh, are artists struggling with, I mean, you're, if you're running at sort of, what, 95% piracy, how easy is it for an artist to get their hands on on revenues in that kind of environment? It's extremely difficult. Like, as as an artist here, you, you well, I guess as an artist anywhere, but Specifically here, you are very much driven with uh, the fact that you want you want to create music and you want to bring out a message, and it's it's a it's a hobby on a little bit on steroids, I guess, um, because you are you do get the celebrity and the fame, uh, but the money does not follow in most cases here. Well, I guess many places it doesn't, but in particularly here, I think. And as you said correctly, is that it's very hard to to earn any sort of royalties. Well, from our from our service included, um, we we do our best to get to get the most possible and fair uh, terms for the for the different content owners. But the reality is just is that the market still is very small, and uh, sort of end up uh, splitting the money in in the different ways that it has to be split, and between the different artists who contributed to to our service. It's just still is a minimal and it's more sort of pocket money than anything else at the moment. You do find some services, particularly in, in Nigeria, which is the biggest market, uh, entertainment market in, on the continent, that can make a good living and can sort of uh, also more than that, who can make a very good amount of money from, from music. But most of it is actually from tickets or from so shows and ticket sales or from endorsements from different brands for brand endorsement. Uh, for marketing pillars and, and so on. And the reason, I might get a little bit unpopular by saying that, but I think the main reason why Nigeria is such a big market is that it is so many people. Definitely a lot of good content and music coming out of Nigeria um, is not to say anything to, to that, but a major advantage that they do have is that it is such a massive market. As an artist, you can sell a, a few yeah, 10, 20, 30,000 uh, tickets, and it's only... Uh, earlier this year that the, one of the biggest artists in Nigeria sold out O2 Arena in London only by using Facebook marketing. No billboards, no nothing at all, just diasporas. Wow. Sold out the whole sta- the whole place. And it is because it is such a massive, massive market, yeah. uh, a massive, massive population. And that is why the economy makes sense because even if you're talking at a very low sort of ticket price and a very low spending power per fan, the market is big enough to still carry uh, carry you forward and and for most of the other markets that's that's very very difficult if not completely impossible to do that that is i think the major difference and that is the situation unfortunately right now as an artist that if if you're not in nigeria or a nigerian artist then it's it's, it's tricky wow i mean that, that that that's pretty impressive because i think the o2 is it's a lot of tickets to sell especially just through facebook and just through uh through like you say the nigerian diaspora in in the uk yeah exactly it's it's insane Now, I know you listen to all of our shows diligently, so you will recall back in episode four, when we spoke to Viv Broughton, we looked very quickly at the impact of social media marketing on streaming revenues and got an idea of just how much bang you get for your buck. In this instance, we're just looking at Facebook and how marketing through that single channel managed to fill London's O2 Arena. Is that a big deal? Well, you decide. The O2 Arena has a capacity of 20,000, the fifth largest indoor arena in Europe, and there is an estimated Nigerian population in England just in excess of 200,000. By only, and I'm doing little air quotes there, by only using Facebook marketing, the promoter has managed to not only reach, but to sell tickets to almost 10% of the Nigerian population in the UK. And for every sellout show, there are always going to be disappointed punters who couldn't or didn't get their hands on tickets, or who were communicated to via Facebook, but weren't interested. So we will never be able to gauge the true reach of this promotion. Safe to say that it did very, very well. Probably better than TV campaign and probably better than a radio campaign. We kind of know that about social media already, don't we? 
So what can we take from that? First off, don't underestimate the power that social media has in today's society. And two, never underestimate the draw that music has on us. Advertisers exploit it and recording companies commercialize it because whether it's from the beating of your heart or the booming of your speaker, you are a human being and music will always touch your soul. Well, I should probably mention now where I am in, in East Africa at the moment that there has been some very, very successful um, artists out of Tanzania as well recently. And I think one of the reasons why they are specifically successful is that a lot of the, the, the music coming out of Tanzania is in Swahili. And Swahili is maybe not as a country. There's no re- like, So Tanzania is by itself is not a, a significant big market, but uh, Swahili itself is a massive language and I think counts for yeah, 80 or 100 million people on the continent as well who speak Swahili. So with the language, they managed to tap into a, a much bigger industry than their own country and obviously also with with producing amazing music that you have to do that as well but they have managed to use that as an advantage and, and often that that critical mass is really the challenge for any artist who who are coming out of this continent so you, you're building quite an interesting picture certainly in terms of your experience but also of the music environment that you're operating within to me to listen to you talk it draws parallels of where we were in the west probably around 15 years ago what would you do differently? What sort of learnings do you think you picked up along the way and think, you know what, if I'd done that differently, I could have saved myself X amount of time or money or... I think sort of, f- first and foremost, I think in the beginning, um, we were a little bit, maybe a little bit obsessed with saying, well, Spotify is, so I've, obviously being Danish, uh, Spotify is, is pretty much 100% market penetration there. Well, I guess it's changed over the last couple of years since I left. But at least when I left, uh, Spotify was sort of, the music service that everyone was using. And I think we were maybe a little bit obsessed by saying, well, Spotify has figured it out. Let's let's build that here. Uh, thinking that you kind of have the solution that that, that that every artist or any music fan here has been has been waiting for. Instead of sort of just stopping up and observing and saying, well, what Spotify really has gotten right in, in, in my perspective and in my observation is that they've understood, okay, we need to give people a really good alternative to what they're currently doing. They did that back then. But in the beginning, in my perspective, at least, that's what it was. That should have been a different starting point from us, should have been saying, well, how are people consuming music today and how do we build something that, that bridges that gap? Um, and I think that's what we what we do today. And 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 uh, as I said, we, we have an Android app, uh, which have sort of similar functionality as any music app uh, globally has. But our focus has was very quickly back into the mobile web version and the very light sort of very... We, we ship our music, for example, in, in a lower quality, um, where I think sort of globally, the, the fighters to have the best quality, both the, the best for the file format and highest quality so that you can ha- listen to it on your on your on your big stereo but but here that's not really the reality of of anyone like they would much rather save one megabyte and most of our consumers would much rather save one megabyte on every song downloaded and getting it in a little bit lower quality because the devices that they're playing the music on cannot play the difference anyway so you might actually not see that we realized that a few years ago and it has really had a had a big impact on our growth and our business but i think that was probably one of them I don't know if there's anything else we would have done differently, but there's definitely tons of, of mm-hmm. learnings down mm-hmm. the road. I'm curious to know how you're, you're working direct with, with artists. I want to try and understand that a little bit more because certainly in the West, you have, well, straight away, you've got the management manager, management team is, is a buffer between the artist and pretty much anybody else. Is there anybody aggregating rights? Are you dealing with sort of managers that you can have one conversation with and they're representing a number? of artists or are these conversations direct to to the artists themselves so so it differs a lot some of the industries are starting to have yeah distributors and, and a little bit more formalized record labels and we do see some artists signing on to major labels as well um, at the moment who are in the recent years been been a lot more aggressive on the continent so so we we find it that it it changes a lot so i think that's maybe actually the learning really is that or the other of how we are we're dealing things is actually to be very very flexible and and from our perspective i think from the beginning it was more about signing locking down rights for a particular artist or a particular track Whereas now it's more to make sure there's an ongoing relationship with a particular artist or a particular manager or a particular label, because we know that what is the reality today is is most likely not the reality in six months or even in, in three months. And so it's more about trying to make sure that they still have the power to do what they sort of follow their normal and natural progression as an, as an artist and, and us sort of just fitting in and, and all the time being that, that piece of the puzzle. 
that fits into their business as it is right now. Um, because the second they start working with a manager or with a label or with anyone else, then we still need to be able to fit in. And so I think that has made us look very differently on on the whole sort of rights and, and, and dealing directly with artists. It's a lot more about providing them with a suite of different tools, whether that's obviously our own platform, uh, promotional, transparency, trust, different things that makes them feel like we are comfortable and a, a good partner to work with for wherever in, this, in the state and there in their career that they are in. Um, and then scaling that up to dealing with, yeah, as I said earlier, 55,000 African artists who obviously have different needs all by themselves. And I mentioned earlier how it can be a challenge for a consumer that you might not have the data needed to, to download a song. The reality is actually the same for many artists who might not have the data to upload a song. I guess the best way to explain it, both on the, on the user base and on the, artist, on the artist side, is trying to build globally, but much, much simpler and in a much, much better and faster and quicker way because of the the lack of internet, uh, potentially internet or connectivity or whatever else it requires to, to be able to access our service. I think that's a really interesting point you make there. And I think it illustrates the, the kind of situation and environment that you're in, in as much as it's not just your users that are mindful of the data cost of downloading music but your artists who also have that as a key consideration as well. I think that's a, that's a really interesting point and you know, helps focus the mind a little bit when we're, when we're trying to sort of think about the, the business environment you're, you're operating in and the people you work with. With that in mind, it sounds to me the kind of relationships that you're building with artists, the sheer number of artists that you've established commercial licensing relationships with it's almost like uh, there's a potential other side of your business operating as an aggregator and and sub licensing on behalf of those artists i'm not sure if that's something that's that you do even or if or if you've thought about and it has come up many times as a, as a strategic option there's sort of some strategic reasons why right now that that is not very interesting for us i think first and foremost that put us in a strategic position as a music service where we have a massive catalog that is not licensed anywhere else. And if you were to come and build it from scratch, it would be hard for them to do it much faster than we do. They could do it, um, but it would probably take as much time as t- taken for us. And that obviously gives us a natural sort of competitive advantage over any service we're looking at at, at this market. Um, and that's a competitive advantage that's that's quite important to us. And then I think, secondly, if you were to redistribute, as I said earlier, our main focus has been on 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 users on this continent, and we feel that users on this continent are best served with with our our service. Now it becomes a little bit hypothetical, but I think if you look ten years into the future, uh, chances are that all the music that is that we are currently licensed directly will probably be available uh, through a distributor, through a label in one way or another. And, and that advantage might not be there, maybe not even 10, maybe a little bit longer. Uh, but at some point, it, it might not be there anymore. But right now, we feel like we should focus on what we are good at, which is the, which is the platform service. The licensing business still is a little bit different, I think. But you're completely right. I think there, there is some opportunities there that could be be some opportunities there uh, sort of hypothetically uh, down down the line. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's something that you've spent a lot of hard work, a lot of time amassing. Like you say, you know, the infrastructure that you work within, unless you put in those hours and you put that time and hard work in, you can't license that music. You know, it makes complete sense for you to, to say, why give away that competitive advantage? You know, you've got such a head start. Anybody else comes into the market, they have to grind through all of that work before they can get to where you are now. Exactly. And and you're absolutely right. I mean, to to move into licensing distribution, it's a completely different business. You know, it, it's 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 not what you're there to do. And and I and I get that and I understand it. Exactly. We're certainly seeing, certainly in the Western markets, over the last eighteen months, two years. There's been a steady trickle that has slowly turned into a raging river of money coming into the industry from all directions, whether that's uh, new businesses starting up, whether it's into copyright acquisition, whether it's platforms, IPOing, the sheer amount of, of interest. And also, you know, l- l- let's be honest, the, the only reason that there is interest is because the business is now generating money again. 
I'm guessing from, from the conversation and from what you told me, you're probably not seeing that effect where you are at the moment. Or are you starting to see sort of interest come from, whether that's through investment vehicles or startups, are you starting to see sort of interest and investment coming into the, the music business in Africa? Well, we are, we are definitely seeing a lot more interest. Um, that's for sure. I think at the moment, a lot of it is strategic. So you'll find that it's someone who's already in the business, but is interested in in, in, in this continent. So it could be a, a record label or a music service or a distributor or, or someone who has experience in the, in the music business. I think we're not at the point where you would find that sort of a venture capital or um, sort of uh, yeah, PE firms and so on would like it's way too early the market for for them I think to look to look at and then way too risky I guess but I think from from those who have a strategic understanding of it and especially for those who have seen the the, the change that has taken place in Asia and in Latin America over the last yeah five years um, and who who was early in those markets and benefited from it both of those cases it's been sort of a, within a fairly short time span that that the market has completely turned around and all of a sudden become very profitable and, and well, at least very high revenue generating markets. There's a huge interest in making sure that you are in this continent at the right time or before the right time, I guess, to benefit from that and position your business in this market as well. I think it is going to happen over in, in a fairly short uh, term, the next couple of years, because we are feeling a lot more interest in the market right now. And, and we are feeling a lot of movement in, in the macroeconomics as well. I think, to be honest, that's probably what's driving it as much as the business itself. I think the change of, of as I said earlier, um, internet usage, uh, smartphone penetration. Um, but I think also in terms of revenue sources, the advertising industry sort of uh, opening up and uh, allocating more and more budget into digital, which is a super interesting channel to, to reach a lot more people at a lot lower rates than what we've been used to before, um, which obviously in a lower margin market, you would want to have the, the lowest cost possible uh, cost of reaching your, your audience. But also from a billing perspective, uh, I'll try and, and, and thread a bit carefully around the telco business. But I think what, what we are seeing here, uh, sort of our comparison to, to, to Europe 10, 15 years ago, is correct in terms of the telco business as well. We've got a, a lot of big telco companies who have in the past uh, or up until today are making quite good margins on, on voice and, and SMS, sort of traditional telco products, um, phone calls and SMSs and so on. But as internet is starting to become more and more uh, used, uh, internet has a much, much lower margin uh, than, than voice and SMS does uh, because it's such a, such a commodity. And what happens with that is that uh, bundling up with, with music services like ourselves uh, becomes a lot more interesting because out of a sudden, if you can get another 10, 20 percent, 30 percent or whatever billing fee you can you can you can eat into of the music service that you're bundling with your with your data offering is out of a sudden a very attractive sort of strategic move as a, for, for a telco. Telco bundling. Let's quickly break that down and look at why it is so important. Telcos, mobile telephone companies, often look to promote their subscription plans by bundling other products or services with their mobile subscription plans. Typically, this product will be music. I don't imagine that there are many countries that don't have the option to choose a mobile phone tariff that comes with 6, 12 or even 24 months free access to a streaming music service of some description. These offers have twofold benefits to the mobile phone company. One, as we've just touched on earlier, music makes us tick as humans. So if you want to sell a product or service, you can't do much better than to strap it to music in some way, shape or form. And secondly, music streaming is still very data intensive. So for the mobile phone company, when you are listening to a streaming service over the air on your phone, you're using up mobile data and therefore clocking up revenue for the mobile phone company because they're going to bill you for that airtime. On the flip side, the streaming service is happy to shoulder the cost of that free subscription period because they, quite rightly, expect the majority of users to become paying subscribers once that free period comes to an end. So for them, it's a very cheap and very effective means of subscriber acquisition, building their audience. And there you were thinking you were getting something for free. Whereas in the past, it hasn't really been because you're making maybe, well, I'm just guessing, I have no idea, but I think at least 50% margins on voice and SMS. So venturing into a business where you're making 10, 20, 30% would, would actually harm your average, your average margins. So I think that change is really what 
change that is a little bit remote from the music industry is actually what's really driving the interest and the money into the industry and will drive profits in the future and the market as well. How are you finding those commercial partnerships, whether they're with telcos or lifestyle brands or FMCG? Do you get many of those? Do they provide much of a, an income source for you? Well, so I think saying whether or not they're bringing much or little, I think it's a bit, it's a bit, uh, it depends on who's looking at it. I think a major pillar for many brands in terms of their marketing, it, it works. Like music and sports are always in there as a, as a, as a major selling point of your, of your products. And that's the case in Africa as well. So it, like, it's not easy. It's not like you can just show up somewhere and say, well, I have a music service and then they'll pour money into it in terms of advertising. That, that's not really how it works. And you are competing with tons of other marketing opportunities the same way we are really in the, in the West. The advertising industry and I, the markets in generally are smaller than uh, what you'll find in, in, in the West. But that being said, you have an equal chance of getting the money as uh, uh, any other uh, initiative that is here. And so I think with the right approach, with the right products, with the right client understanding of and, and sort of the right networks on the continent, I, I think it's uh, in, the, in, the, in the next couple of years uh, going to be only more attractive than it is right now. I think from the individual artist perspective, it has been a very, very good avenue and still is a very good avenue for brand endorsements or uh, licensing your your pictures and your music for ads in one way or another. Uh, your name is quite big business on the continent and probably the biggest in terms of revenue or income for, for an individual artist. We've spoken about how you got there. You've given us, a, I, think, I think, a really sort of interesting and vibrant picture of uh, how the business is and the type of um, environment and marketplace that you're operating in. With one eye to the future, what do you, what's on your horizon at the moment? What do you see happening over the next, well, in the short term, one, two, possibly three years ahead? Yeah, well, I think actually just to, there's just one, one, one thought that's popping into my head that I think um, I haven't mentioned too much about the past as well, the last, the last couple of years, that it can be quite hard to get information about which artists are popular or which artists are actually even something that's worth signing. So basically what you'd find is if you, if you wanted to rebuild a catalog here, you want to build a music service in, um, I'll, I'll say Zambia, which is one of the markets we started in last year. What music are people listening to in Zambia? You'll only be able to sort of, uh, sort of Google your way to a few or a handful of artists. It takes quite a lot of work to actually try and under- to, to get that sort of long tail and better understanding of what people are actually really listening to yeah, like at home, on the bars and so on. And so that's actually been a massive part of our, of our business uh, the last couple of years is actually to try and and understand how do we best get this knowledge on our fingertips? How do we make sure that, I mean, there's a new song out in Mozambique, we know it within a few couple of days. Because the absence of a label or the absence of sort of a distributor means that that information doesn't necessarily transfer to us very um, easily. We might not know before when a song, before a song is out. We might not know it until a few days after it's already been out because it might not have made it into social media or the, the marketing push might not have been as successful as the artists would have hoped for. Just to add to the point of the, the challenges of entering the markets, of re- recreating the catalog in one way and another, a big part of it is actually sort of knowing what's happening, knowing which artists are big. There, there are no sort of charts or no place you can go, sort of go and check uh, what are the most popular music right now. How are you doing that? You don't, do you have people in those markets? We, we, we do, but they are also very biased often, not, not on purpose. Like they're, they're great people, but they are biased towards the, <laughs> they're, they're biased towards the, 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 the music they like. Or one thing you have across Africa is different tribes. So Kenya itself is 42 different tribes. They all have different artists that sings in their language. And so if you are, if your person on the ground is from one of those tribes, then he might not observe the music that's coming out in the other end of the country. So we do have people on the ground. We, we try and, and do a lot of listening online on social media as uh, we try and figure out what are people talking about and what music is actually happening. But we, we get surprised often, like it's hyper, hyper local. Um, the biggest artists are not necessarily the urban artists who, and again, sort of trying to, to thread carefully, not necessarily the artists that the major labels who might not necessarily be present here are, are, getting, are getting their attention. And uh, sort of urban, big in the media space sort of artists. Often it's the artist in Western Kenya or Northern Nigeria who sings in a lo- very li- hyper-local language, 
who has his fans there who are very loyal, who sort of has that very local added element to it so that those fans or those use, uh, kind of customers will, will only really be able to find them. They are super loyal uh, and will download the whole catalog over and over again. And they are actually more often than not the ones that top our charts and the ones that really pushes numbers for, for us, not necessarily uh, the urban artists who are very famous on Instagram or whatever other platforms that it is. Uh, maybe are big on social media because of how they are how they're dressed or uh, what they stand for or whichever the social brand that they have and so that's actually a, a learning that we've found quite a lot that that regional hyper local uh, music is of extreme importance but also extremely hard to get hold of because it won't really show up in your social media listening and it won't really show up in in the sort of surveying or whatever you're you're looking at you only really know it when you have the person on the platform and all of a sudden you start seeing tons of downloads of, of particular artists. We do use our own internal search search as well, so we can see what people are searching on our platform. So I can look at, okay, what are people searching in Zambia? Uh, yes. What are people searching for in Zambia? And if it's not on my platform, then we'll call the guy on the ground and say, find out who this is, who owns the rights, and how do we get it on the platform? That's probably our best and most reliable tool, to be honest. So not only are you dealing with the sort of difficulties of, of running a cross-territory service, within those territories, you've got subdivisions based on tri tribal affiliations, based on language, and I guess there's diaspora within, within Africa as well. It sounds hard work. I mean, it certainly sounds a lot harder than just doing a... A yeah. licensing deal and then ingesting the entire catalog from from one label yeah for sure and but it's also what is a super 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 exciting and the added sort of spice to it is that you are working in a very low spending power is very low so you've got to do everything extremely scalable and at an extremely low acquisition cost but i think for us that's also what is so exciting that if you can actually make it sustainable and make something that we have been running for, for I guess, uh, almost seven years. When you can start actually doing it at a, at a cost where it makes sense at a, in a sustainable way where you're not just buying up a lot of rights for, for money that you might not make back on those rights. So that's what really excites us and what makes the business uh, uh, very interesting for us. Well, I mean, yeah, you, you just mentioned a very important point, and that's the, that's the cost associated with licensing in the West. You're absolutely right. I can't think of a single platform that has made any profit at all, certainly within the first few years of launch. And I think what you're, you're learning the hard way, how to run a business on relatively low outgoings. You're working within a, certainly a technological infrastructure that is perhaps not immediately predisposed to, to running a, a download platform. So it sounds as if your users are sort of paying as they go for their data. There's a real question over the cost of data. You know, people are mindful of how they spend that. You know, you're having to go and have conversations with artists. In fact, you're having to find out who those artists are in other countries. And I think all of that, whilst it sounds like a lot of hard work, what a great way to learn to run a business. Because if you can run a business within that framework, once you start getting to that point where you can scale, once you get to that point where you have greater data penetration at, at a cheaper rate, once those artists become more accessible then really that's when all of this, I, st I guess, when all of this hard work starts to bear fruit. For sure. No, definitely. And I, and I, t I, tell, I tell the artists that I meet on, on this, uh, meet, meet here every single time that uh, you might be jealous of, 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 the, of the music industry and the structures and so on that are in, in the West. But sort of in terms of like knowing how to be an independent artist and how to deal with chaotic structures and being your own manager and sort of dealing with the business 360, African artists has a massive advantage because they've done that forever. They know exactly how to do that. And it's not a change for them that all of a sudden you don't necessarily have a label. It's just not ever been like that. And, and I think that's, as you're saying, a very, very good way of actually understanding the business um, 360. You, you're right, you know, and, and from an artist perspective, I mean, what we're seeing here in the West is an increase in artists wanting to retain autonomy, wanting to retain independence. And they're not jumping for the label deal straight away. They are managing these things things themselves. I can see how you're sort of fostering that relationship 
with artists where you are and from the sound of things that's their approach because there are no labels anyway so i can see there's a sort of certain irony in uh, in what's going on here and and what you're seeing or the, or the way that artists are behaving over there the whole label artist paradigm here is is shifting dramatically i mean we're pretty much every conversation we have you know this comes up you know the diy approach to recording to distributing as technology improves as technology changes then the artist's ability to take control over these aspects of their their business become greater and it becomes easier you know it, it, it's not massive by any means but it's certainly growing this transition away from you know setting out for a label deal to thinking well actually hang on a minute how much of this can I retain for myself? How much control can I keep? It seems like conversely, your artists are having to do that as out of necessity rather than choice. And it, it'll be interesting to to see sort of how things change sort of if and when you, you do start to start getting labels, rights holders coming into uh, more African territories and starting to work directly with artists there. Because it may well be that I know, I know a check with a lot of zeros can, can change a lot of people's mind. But it, it may well be that, you know, they, they, they come in too late. And through services like your own, the skills those artists are learning make it easier for them to, to manage their own businesses. And again, you know, let's not, talk, let's not forget about management. You know, a key facilitator and a key driver in artists managing their own careers in this way are the new breed of music manager you've got coming through it's interesting to hear to hear that and i can sort of see how there's almost two parallel things going on here and there may well be a point where where the two of them sort of converge if you like where you know we we have a a very sort of healthy diy artist environment in the west that just kind of merges into to what you have in in africa so that you know when you've got new services coming in it's the artist they're talking to in the same way that you've had to, rather than uh, a label or a or a distributor. No, exactly. But but I think uh, that that being said, I, like we, we we do work with both distributors and and labels as well, and also and also some majors. And uh, like of course, over the next couple of years, we'll receive more and more catalog from from those sort of channels that are structured more than what we know in in the West. But for a very very long period of time, also ten, probably also longer. Uh, 15, 20 years, there will be a massive amount of catalog which will be independent and where uh, we actually look towards what the, the DIY services globally are doing and the same way we managed to build an almost, uh, well, it's the same way we are aiming at, at building a, a music service for a user that uh, can do the same things or can meet the same needs that the user have, similar to what global music services can do. The same way we look very much at what DIY services and are offering to artists and how they're doing it and then looking at okay isn't this service has managed to to build such a such a feature for for the artist and that's beneficial can we do something similar that uh, simplifies it in, in some way or makes it relevant for the environment that the artists are in right now uh, but in a way where it's, it's beneficial for them um, at the moment you're, you're completely right that the merging of the two and seeing how they balance out it, it, extremely, extremely interesting. And I think the difference between me and many of the international music services is that it's hard for, um, I guess, Apple Music and and uh, and, and Spotify and, and, and Deezer and so on to, to maybe have this conversation because they, they sort of had to, to thread a bit carefully around the relationship with the major, major, major labels and so on. For us, it's, there is no really alternative. So we're starting the other way around. And has maybe a little bit more flexibility in saying, well, whatever music that you as a major label or you as a major distributor wants to give us, well, we are, we are happy to work around that. But it's obvious that we have to to offer something directly to artists. It gives us a, 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 an opportunity to try and create an environment where there's space for both and where both can serve the purpose that works best for them and is better off signing with a label, uh, either local major or distributor. Well, then that's an option that works very well for me as well. So it sort of turns things a bit upside down. And I think that's a very interesting, that's going to be very interesting to see how that's going to go the next couple of years. I agree with you. And and the point you make about, about majors is that it makes me think of licensing agreements that I've worked on on behalf of major labels. 
and you know these are for global streaming platforms and in those agreements there are prohibitions or there have been I, I, I can't say whether there are now uh, but I'm certainly aware of clauses in agreements that prohibit the platform from having direct communications with any artists as soon as you've entered into a, an agreement with that contains restrictive clauses of that nature you can't go away and do what you've been doing so your hands are tied straight away it's, it's very interesting and I think it's going to be good to see what the future holds and how things progress and develop and I guess with that in mind what's on what's on your radar for the short term for Mdundo and is, is there anything that you guys are preparing for or, or getting excited about? Uh, yeah, tons of things tons of things. Right now um, the, the most exciting part for us is um, I've, as I mentioned earlier we've sort of been fairly established in three markets which are Tanzania, Kenya and Uganda and I've sort of fine-tuned the model over the, over the last couple of years. And already over the last nine months since we sort of started in, in, in seven new markets, we've seen a very, very quick uptake, um, which kind of proves uh, or has been the, the, the point has been to prove the scalability of the model that we can actually um, scale, first of all, the content operation. That's really the, the first step because you can't really open a music service anywhere without the music. Um, so our ability to very quickly identify, onboard, and license, and doing that simultaneously in seven, several markets at once, uh, that's the very interesting space. And we're actually at a point now where in many of those uh, new seven markets, we, we have quite decent catalogs. And so that means we get into sort of stage two, which is people starting using the music service from those markets. And we are seeing a quite good growth in many of, of, of those territories. I think the 3 million active users we have on our service now is is not a significant penetration across the continent, even though it's a, a fairly strong, a big number for, for East Africa alone. But I think this exercise we're going through now will really have a big effect on that number and prove that our service is out of a sudden relevant for a much, much bigger market. So I think for us, that's going to be super, super, super exciting to see how quickly that uptake is going to be and if it's going to uh, reflect how quick it was to, to scale our, our content operation in those markets. That's sort of the main thing right now that is that is really, really exciting. Cool, cool, fantastic. Martin, listen, I'm very conscious of the time. I just want to say thank you for making the time to join us today. I know you're a, you're a busy guy. Yeah, of course. And um, listen, best of luck with everything that you're doing. Hopefully we've introduced a few people to a, a service that they weren't familiar with in, in a territory that they were even less familiar with. So so thank you for joining thank us. Thank you very much. I hope so. Uh, we are last in line here. I think it's the last sort of part of the world that really has to take off and, and we, are, we are well on track and really excited for the next couple of years are going to give us. But yeah, thank you so much for inviting me on the show and thanks for the chat. Pleasure, pleasure. Music Talks. Well, I hope that opened a door in a market and a side of the industry that you might otherwise not have had the pleasure of being introduced to. And what an interesting guy. Talk about not choosing the easy path, eh? Must be some lessons in there for all of us, right? I think Martin has built a real model for building a service where there is no infrastructure, a fragmented market across multiple territories, so that when you find the secret formula, you can deploy it multiple times and build it into something really meaningful, which I think is what Martin and his team have managed. Don't forget, Umdundo is a global service, so you can check it out wherever you are on this planet. Download the Android app, check them out online, get to it, don't sleep. And remember, if you want a taste of that Mdundo sunshine, get to the Spotify playlist that accompanies this week's show. Just search on Spotify for Music Talks Podcast and hear the rhythm and sound of the Music Talks Podcast. So that's it for another episode of Music Talks. Massive thanks to Martin and everyone at Mdundo. As always, the backroom team here at Music Talks. Mucho, mucho gracias to Brutal Deluxe for the theme and the audio that you heard this week and every week. In fact, get over to our Spotify page to hear more from the beautiful Brutal Deluxe. As always, I'm Leon Hill. This has been a Music Talks production. And until next week, it's all about Africa. Yeah.